Hello. Um, Take it away. So am I being heard on a speaker in the classroom right now? Yes. OK. I just could cheated you, and brought in one of my Bluetooth speakers. Could you flip your camera around so I could see the class, uh, just so I can see what the, the size of the class is? Well, I don't know if my camera <laughs> will give you that much of a sense of the class, but I can. Like, oh, there's everybody. Hi. <laughs> I'll leave you like this. OK. Can you pitch the, the lid down just a little bit? <laughs> that would help, wouldn't it? More like that? Excellent. That's perfect. There we go. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Gill. I am currently a postdoc working up at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, Catherine and I. Uh, share a long history. We were in the same PhD lab years ago studying sea slugs together. Uh, what I want to do today. When I met it, you, you were an undergrad. I mean, let's, let's, <laughs> let's be clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like 15 years. Yeah. Um, what I want to do today is present um, two pretty unrelated uh, success stories that. I've had that are about um, using Python and open source collaboration over GitHub in order to get st cool stuff done. So the first thing I want to show you is going to be about some of my thesis work that I did while I was working in that C slug lab doing neuroscience with Catherine. And then the second thing is going to be about a hobby project. So let me share my first presentation. Much more of a big brother aspect that way. OK, can everybody see this? Yep. OK, how Python and open source collaboration helped me graduate or helped me survive graduate school could be the alternate title, perhaps. Um, all right, so the lab that Catherine and I both worked in some years ago studied these creatures. So these are marine sea slugs. They live in the ocean. They get to be quite big, and they eat seaweed, and they have a relatively simple nervous system that makes them easy to study, and that's the reason people like to study them for neuroscience, because you can more easily correlate neural activity with behavior and try to understand how this whole system works. They have a relatively simple musculature as well. So you can kind of, well, Catherine would disagree with that. I, I, I strike that, that statement. Um, but this is the sort of thing <laughs> that they eat. Well, I mean, so, and Roy would disagree with the simple nervous system. So, yeah. you know, go with it. Yeah. Uh, you can study these things for decades and there's still just so much more to try to understand. But anyway, these are the sorts of seaweeds that these creatures feed on. Um, I just want to show you a few additional photos I have. So this is sort of the, the natural habitat where they can be found. Uh, there was one year, I think it was maybe 2017 or 2016, something like that. We went out to a neuroscience conference out in San Diego. And the way we would receive these sea slugs in Cleveland, where, of course, we're nowhere near the ocean, is we had a diver who would go out and collect the animals for us in environments like this, tide pools or shallow ocean waters, and then would ship them overnight to us via FedEx to Cleveland, where we would then uh, keep them in our aquaria and eventually do neuroscience experiments with them. And so this was a really beautiful environment, and we got the opportunity to go out and look for sea slugs with our collector, this guy on the left, Josh. Uh, you may recognize two of the people here. Um, and then there's Emily there in red, who was uh, an undergraduate working in the lab at the time. And I think what I'll show you real quick, hopefully this video plays all right. This is kind of what their, their movements look like in our aquaria when they're crawling around but I have sped up the video like 10 times. So if you spend enough time looking at these creatures, you'll start to think they're kind of cute. Sometimes the first reaction is, ooh, that's gross, but um, they're, they're 
common name is the California sea hare because they have those little rabbit ear like things on top of their heads. Uh, what's stranger still about these animals is the way they feed. Their mouths are nothing like our own. They have inside of their head a specialized organ called the uh, radula odonophore, which is that thing you see protruding out. And it's designed to grab seaweed and pull it back in through this rhythmic motion. And our lab specialized in studying the neuromechanics of how this worked. How did the neuro, how did the neurons control this, this feeding apparatus, and how did the musculature work in order to respond to those controls and provide sensory feedback as well? So for the project that I was working on when I was a PhD student, I was able to do these experiments where I would implant electrodes in live sea slugs and then feed them while, and then record from these electrodes while they were behaving in order to see what their nervous system was doing as they were feeding. And the problem I had when it came to data analysis was I really wanted to be able to kind of reconstruct the experiment after the fact by being able to display side by side the video that I was recording using a simple webcam and the neural signals that I was collecting using our fancy electrophysiology equipment. And the solution that many students who had come through the lab in the past use was they would open a video file in one program, they would open uh, the neural signals in a second program, and they would manually try to line up where these two things go. And if you have an hour long recording, maybe dozens of them, this is a really painful process because you're constantly wondering, hmm, have I lined this up right? Maybe I'm looking at the wrong feeding behavior. So let me just give you a sense of what this is like. So here's a, a screenshot on the right from a video taken during one of my experiments where we have this sea slug. It is feeding on this strip of sushi nori that I have dangling from a force transducer. And it's reinforced. It's marked in with, centimeters. Don't marked it in centimeters. <laughs> yes. So that's what these silver markings are. And in fact, it's reinforced with double-sided tape so that it wouldn't tear. But that's not it's terribly important here. What is important is you can see this line coming out of the side of the animal's head. And that is an electrode bundle. Uh, prior to this feeding experiment, what I did was I anesthetized the animal and I implanted these uh, electrodes on some of its nerves and muscles so that I could get these electrical recordings that you see on the left. And what we have here is a cascading series of activations of muscles and neurons seen on nerves, which thanks to decades of hard work done in this field, we're able to identify the neurons that are involved in this behavior simply based on their the size of the spikes seen on these recordings, as well as their timing. And the particular issue I wanna talk about today is synchronizing the video with this electrical data. So for example, um, this screenshot lines up with that precise moment in the neural data where I placed the red line. And what I'd love to be able to do is scrub through the video and see precisely what was going on in the neural data, neural data at the same time. So I tried lots of things, none of which I was terribly happy with until one day I discovered an open source Python library called FEViewer. This was being created by um, a, well, I'll, I'll get into that. But basically, this was a, um, a tool that basically did exactly what I needed. It was a, a, a GUI library in Python that you could use for free. You can install it with pip that allowed you to, to plot electrophysiology signals and video. And when I first tried to start to use this, I didn't know terribly much about Python at the time. But I was excited to learn more about it. And uh, the first few videos that I tried, some of them worked, some of them didn't. There were some issues. So through GitHub, which is where the source code is hosted. I don't know if, Catherine, have you talked at all about code repositories or version control or GitHub at all? GitHub has been mentioned a few times, but we haven't gone into it in any depth. So a, a quick overview would be helpful. OK. so. There's a website called GitHub, and it's where people can store their code. And that 
includes keeping the full complete history of the code. And it's a great space for collaboration because you can communicate about issues that the code is having. You can propose changes and bug fixes to other people's code and they can review it before incorporating it into your work. So I reached out to the creator of Effie Viewer on GitHub and within a day, I think he was able to fix my problem with this, the, the video playback. And I was incredibly happy because I finally had the perfect thing that I needed. Now this was a, a library, so I needed to build the tools for myself that I wanted to use for my experiments. Basically what I was given from Effie Viewer was functions that would generate different viewers that could be constructed into an application. So there was still work to do, but finally I had the basis for what I needed. Um, so Samuel Garcia, he's the uh, mastermind behind this project and several related projects. If ever I have the uh, good luck of meeting him in real life, I definitely owe him a beer. Um, so Effie Viewer is built on a few layers of libraries. Maybe some of you have heard about Qt, which is I think originally in, in C++, um, but there are Python bindings for Qt that let you build applications using something called PyQt. There are other flavors as well, like PySide, um, maybe one or two others. But that, that was the foundation for Effie Viewer. And built on top of that is another Python library called PyQt Graph which is pure Python, and it simplifies the use of PyQt and is designed for mathematics and science and engineering applications. And it's a really, really powerful tool that has all sorts of cool plotting capabilities. And what Effie Viewer does is it builds on top of that and makes something that is really easy to use for elect electrophysiology stuff. It's still an API, it's still a library meant to be used by coders, but um, it had everything I needed. So I spent the next um, maybe year and a half developing an application that could use Effie Viewer in order to do exactly what I needed for my experiments, be able to show that video next to the neural recordings. And the end product is something that I called neurotic. Um, I called it that because that's how I was feeling at the time as I was trying to finish up my PhD. Um, my advisor advised that maybe it would be a good idea that we, we come up with a, we say that this is an acronym for something. So it became Neuroscience Tool for Interactive Characterization. Uh, it has lots of capabilities, but one of the things that I designed it to do was to make it easy to use for non-programmers. So. Uh, I'll show you what that means in a moment, but just to complete the picture here, Neurotic is an application as well as a library that you can use in scripts or in Colab or in uh, on the command line in P IPython, for example. And that in turn is built on top of FP Viewer as well as several other things. So I know you've been studying GUIs a lot recently, and this is kind of how this fits into that. Uh, the way I designed uh, people like other members of my lab to work with Neurotic was to be able to create simple uh, lists of data, such as what you're seeing right here in a format called YAML, where you could basically list out all of the files that are associated with an experiment. Like where's the video file located and what's it called? Where's the neural data file located? How would you like to align these two things? How do you want to plot things? What channels do you want to show? What kind of filters do you want to apply? I added all these extra features that you could just implement or specify in this sort of YAML format. And then the end result would be something like this. So here I'm showing a screenshot from the application, uh, which I can pull up here in a moment. But here we're seeing exactly what I wanted to see, which is that screenshot on the right. And on the left, we have the neural data and there's a line that lines up with it. And importantly, along the top there, there's a slider that lets you uh, scrub through the entire experiment and, and 
both the video and the neural data will update with it. And you can see here in color, all these colorful dots that I have on the left, those are uh, action potentials being detected on each of these different recordings. So I could do a lot of preliminary analysis that was extremely useful for what I was doing. So just going back to that one, just yeah. in terms of what the lines mean, and this is maybe more, this might be just that I was in the same lab. It looks to me like you have an upper line, which is an EMG. That's right. And then three lines of neural recordings. That's and right. then the bottom one is a force transducer. That's exactly right. Yeah, so this big slow moving curve is the force transducer measuring the, the pulling force of the animal as it's trying to swallow this piece of unbreakable sushi nori. And so something I ended up doing for my thesis work was correlating that neural activity with the, the force output of the animal in order to understand that better. Uh, I ultimately ended up producing a publication in uh, eNeuro describing this tool so that others could find it. Um, happily, Sam was, my, was one of my co-authors. Um, so you can read that paper yourself if you're interested. Um, and this is this is just for me a really heartwarming uh, collaboration story on uh, open source software where I went out looking for something I had a need someone had built something that uh, could be adapted to what I needed and then hey I was able to graduate yeah <laughs> and now you're Dr. Yu yes and now I'm Dr. Gill <laughs> yeah. Um, Here's some additional details for finding neurotic if you're interested. Um, but I think what I'll do briefly is maybe actually pull up the application and show you what I'm talking about. So here I can just move the slider around or use some arrow keys on the keyboard in order to pan through my experiment in order to get a sense of what was going on. And I can do things like zoom in and zoom up and down. A lot of these capabilities come for free thanks to the use of PyQt graph under the hood. But as you can see, this is a standalone application window that exists. Uh, I, I'm running Windows right now, so it, it can just be launched from the uh, start menu, or it could be launched from the command line. And this was a game changer tool for me in my, uh, my research. Do you have a sense of what kind of a community is now using it since you've published it and launched it? I'm not sure. That's hard to gauge. Um, there are statistics on package download rates for things like PyPy, and I even have it up on the Anaconda package manager. And they tend to be, I think, dramatically inflated because bots are downloading these things. Um, I haven't received a lot of contact about it, but I have reached out to uh, the larger sea slug neuroscience community that was um, collaborating with our lab and told them about it. So I'm hoping it's still getting some use. It's certainly still getting some use in our lab, but yeah. Former lab. Former lab, yeah. I don't, I don't believe it's getting use in the um, Taylor lab at the moment. Not at the moment, yeah, yeah. Though I wouldn't be surprised if it did at some point. Perhaps. So that or, ended up. Go ahead. Or a form of it. So that ended up getting uh, published as a package on PyPy, as well as, like I said, on the Anaconda package repository, specifically Conda Forge, if any of you are familiar with that. So it's possible with a single line of code to basically install the entire application. Um, and a lot of work went into making it as user friendly as possible. Okay, that's my first story. Does anyone have any questions at this point? You relay it through me. Yeah, I'll have to. Okay, okay. So Ember is curious in um, that you said you were unfamiliar with Python when you started this process. And I don't think you were entirely unfamiliar. Wasn't entirely unfamiliar, but I definitely um, but the, did. The timeline between when you started 
working with Python to when you were like making your own, you know, library and your own project and publishing? Yeah. Hmm. I think maybe my very first uh, taste of Python might have come from Catherine a couple years earlier. And were you uh, around when Kendrick was using it for the early version of NeuroWiki? The pre JavaScript no. version. So there was a oh, version oh, of NeuroWiki that ran everything on Python, and this is the one that crashed the server during the exam. Yes, I was around for that. Yeah, not NeuroWiki, but the um, the simulations associated yeah, with that yeah, class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I did have some contact with Python in the form of a, a TAing ship that I had at the time, but I wasn't using it a lot, and around the time that I went looking for this solution and end up discovering Effie Viewer, I was wanting to get into Python because I had a lot of mastery of another very powerful programming language called Mathematica, thanks to our advisor who really loved it. But um, because that software is proprietary and I kind of love the open source vibe, um, and I was worried about maybe someday not having a license to Mathematica anymore, and so I wouldn't be able to use it. I thought I should expand my skill set. Uh, I really liked programming from the start, so I went looking for something, and I thought Python would be a great option. I think Catherine probably had a big part in con convincing me of that. And uh, so then I, I discovered Epi Viewer, and I was competent enough at the time in order to uh, to use it at a basic level, but it was probably over a year of using it again and again and restructuring what I was building before it transformed first as just a script that I made for myself in order to do one little thing into a full-blown application where it was easy for other people to use, even if they didn't know any Python. And then it was only when that was done that we thought, hey, let's try to publish this as well in uh, the eNeuro publication. So that was probably another six months or something. Does that answer the question? Anyone else? So it sounds like you have a bit of time for story number two. OK, great. I've got about 15 minutes, right? Yep. OK. So talk number two, how Python and open source collaboration saved my hobby project. OK, so has anyone here heard of Critical Role? You can raise your hand if you have. No? Oh, that's too bad. Um, One person that? over here in the corner okay. beside me. Excellent. So what what is Critical Role? It is um, a Dungeons and Dragons show that you can watch on YouTube or Twitch. They stream every week. And they also release a podcast form of their show. It's a bunch of friends who happen to be voice actors sitting around playing Dungeons and Dragons. And they've been doing this for uh, maybe eight years or something like that. Uh, the show has grown in popularity steadily since like 2015 when they first launched. And recently, they got a partnership with Amazon Prime and their their campaign, their story that they were playing out at the table was turned into an animated series on Amazon Prime called The Legend of Ox Machina. You should totally check it out. Uh, season two came out uh, a month ago or so. Um, and it's wonderful. And it, it's critical role has contributed, I think, a lot to a rise in popularity of Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop gaming in recent years. Um, so what I'm was school, my- I'm old school, I started in the early 80s, so. Yeah. All that gray hair. So like I said, they release their content both in video format on say YouTube where it's archived forever, as well as in podcast format. And I, if I'm listening or watching to their show, sometimes I like to go back and forth between these two media because Sometimes your eyes are free and you want to watch the, the show and see what's going on. And other times you want to go for a walk or go for 
uh, a drive and you want to switch to the podcast. Um, each of these episodes that they have, which are aired each week, are maybe on average four hours long. And there are hundreds of episodes at this point. So there's a lot of content to consume. Sometimes you can be uh, binging this stuff for, for ages. Um, but the, the problem that I had with this idea of switching back and forth between video and podcast was that the timestamps didn't line up. So if I was, for example, three hours into a video and now I want to switch to the podcast, um, the timing for that exact moment where I left off might be different by, who knows, maybe half an hour. Um, the equivalent times in different media weren't the same. And I understood the reason for this. Um, there are, so during a typical YouTube video, which is the recording of them sitting around the table playing this game together, uh, there's a long segment of maybe two hours of them playing, and then maybe a 10 minute break, and then another long segment of two hours playing, and then some, some like after show uh, fan art credits on the show. Um, this differed from how they would structure the podcast. They would take those same play sections, which I've marked here in gray, but pad them with different break content, basically. They might put uh, an introduction to the podcast at the very beginning, and then they might substitute the original break with a much briefer break that's saying, uh, let's get back to the show. And then they might end it differently. So if we compare these two lines here, the gray sections are essentially the same. Those are the actual play content, but the red sections differ. And because of that, if I was say 50% of the way through the, uh, the video's second segment, the time that I would need to jump to in the podcast was rather different. Um, so I came up with this idea of, I, it kind of just struck me one day. I was like, hmm, I wonder if I could predict what the jump time is. I wonder if I could calculate that somehow. And I thought about it and realized that what I would need is to be able to know each of these beginning and ending time points for these gray sections, which are in common. These are the, the real content of the podcast. So I've marked those time points as A and A prime, B and B prime, C and C prime, D and D prime. And if I had those numbers, I could use linear interpolation in order to figure out the correct time. So for example, if I know that I'm starting on the YouTube recording here at this, at this yellow point, that's where I'm at in the show right now. And I'm halfway between C and D, what I want to do is switch to being halfway between C prime and D prime in the podcast. And if I know the values, the timing of C, D, C prime, and D prime, I can interpolate between those values. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do that with Python. And so I uh, collected, so, so what I'm showing down here, actually, before I jump ahead is the sort of data structure that I'm talking about where I've got eight different timestamps that correspond to moments in the YouTube video and moments in the podcast. Each of these numbers down here correspond to the A and A prime, B and B prime, et cetera, from above. So I collected some of these numbers for a couple episodes manually and put them into a file that I stored in JSON format, which is a common data storage format. And I thought, let me see what I can do with Python. So in about an afternoon, I whipped up something like this. And I don't expect you to read it all or anything. But this is basically a simple script that uses NumPy's interpolate function in order to do the magic. Pretty much all the magic is in this one line. Uh, and what I discovered was, hey, it works pretty great. I can jump from. Uh, one media to the other or vice versa from the, the video to the podcast or back. And I could get as precise as I wanted. I could be down to the word at the moment during the, the podcast. So uh, a Python script 
that runs on my computer is great. But then I thought, well, I wonder if other people would find this useful. So weeks go by, and I turn it into um, a web app that I call Crit Roll Sync, which you can visit at critrollsync.github.io. It looks like this. Um, I basically, my, my Python code was a prototype, and what I did was I completely re-implemented it in the logic in JavaScript and created a front end for it in HTML and CSS. And now you can go to this website on your phone or on your computer, and it will pull up something that looks like this. It lets you select your episode, you punch in your time, and it can convert to the other thing for you. Um, and I thought that's pretty cool. I've still got a lot of work to do in the form of cataloging all of those timestamps for the hundreds of episodes that are ahead of me. Maybe I could get some help from fans of Critical Role. So I posted this idea on the Critical Role Reddit and was met with a lot of approval. Um, people were very excited about it and I got lots of volunteers who were interested in going through these podcasts and these videos and just documenting the times when breaks started and ended. And this was great. It was Everything was working wonderfully. I had a wonderful app that solved my problem, my silly little problem of wanting to be able to switch back and forth between these two little, these two media. Everything was great. But then one month later, uh, something happened called dynamic ad insertion. So uh, this nearly broke everything. The people who released this podcast, which had been out for years, suddenly at this time decided, you know what, let's go back and revise our podcast catalog and change all of the advertisements in our podcast episodes. And let's start changing them up every week. Um, all of these red sections became unpredictable durations in the podcast audio. They would change depending on which ad was being run on any given week. And these could change unpredictably and it would do it across the entire catalog of episodes. And it's like with other thing, they're doing more targeted ads too, yes? As far as, as, I can as far as I can tell, these are not targeted in the sense that one one listener would get one ad, another listener would get a different ad. If that happens, I'm really screwed. Okay, because um, that has been happening in other podcasts. I don't know how broad it is. Yeah. Um, and I suddenly get all these like Chapel Hill local ads with my podcast. Ooh. It's very strange. I wonder how they know. Are they looking at your IP address or something? Yeah, yeah, that would be. Oh gosh, if that happens, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> it probably depends on what, podcast studio is you know doing the release yeah so anyway i i had the help from a bunch of volunteers putting together all of these timestamps so that i could do this and it was supposed to be a one-time thing and then they start changing the podcasts and now i've got pretty good my, my app would provide pretty good estimates for jumping back and forth but previously it was perfect you could get down to the same sentence or the same word in a single sentence so I really wanted to do better. So again, this is a story about collaboration on GitHub being awesome. Um, all of my code was housed on GitHub. Even the site itself is run, uh, is served by GitHub. But I used GitHub's issue tracker in order to put out kind of um, a call for help on this sort of thing. I had limited time to dedicate to this because this was a side hobby project. Um, but I did have kind of a plan, which was maybe if we did this crazy thing, we could sort of automate this process. We could have code that downloaded the podcast audio file, downloaded the YouTube audio file, and then use some sort of audio synchronization detection scheme in order to line these two things up and figure out how to match one audio stream to another. I knew I would I would love to build this in Python because by this time I was very comfortable with Python, but I hadn't found a library that could do it yet. Once again, someone on the internet came to my rescue. Um, this guy, uh, Simon Bauer, I'm gonna guess his last name is pronounced. Uh, if Again, if I ever meet him in real life, I owe him a beer. 
um, he was able to find a an open source package or project called Deja Vu, which implements um, an audio fingerprinting and recognition algorithm entirely in Python. Basically, what it can do is it can look at one piece of audio and then memorize it. And then if it hears that audio again, it can identify how it matches up. Uh, there are popular apps like Shazam, which do a similar thing, where you can use your phone in order to ask it, what's the song that I'm hearing? And it will tell you. And it's using this sort of underlying uh, algorithm. So I'll, I'm just going to go over this very briefly. This is from the blog of the Deja Vu creator. But what they do is they use matplotlib and scipy in order to generate spectrograms of audio such as this, where uh, you've got color indicating amplitude or power of different frequencies on the y-axis across the duration of the song on the x-axis. And by identifying the local peaks in the amplitude or power spectra of the music, or in this case, a podcast, you can create constellations of points that are relatively robust to noise. So if you were, say, listening to a song and there's background noise, these things would hopefully survive. And then the application is able to use this fingerprinting process in order to identify uh, songs and match them up. So uh, I'm just going to skip past this for time. Um, here's a small snippet of code that Simon uh, was able to write. Um, which does most of the work. It's using the Deja Vu application in order to fingerprint songs and to recognize songs, or in my case, clips of the audio podcast. And thanks to what, what he did was he created a simple prototype that demonstrated the proof of concept. And then I ran with it and made a full-blown uh, Docker container that lets me do all of the most of the synchronization in a semi-automated way using one command. So I can just run a command like this, and it will go out. This is sped up, but it will go out to YouTube and fetch the audio. It will go out to the podcast, fetch that audio, fingerprint both of those things, match them up, figure out what the time differences are, and then give me all of those timestamps right here as output, and then just automatically fills them into the data.json. So now, every time a podcast app changes, I can run this command and update my timestamps. And uh, I think without this, maybe the project was a little bit doomed. Um, if they start serving personalized ads, it might be really doomed. But so far, things are going well. And I'm, I'm proud of it. And uh, Anyway, that's that's my hobby project. <laughs> Any questions about that? I think everyone's nerdity has gone up at least three points just from having been in this room. <laughs> you know, when I met you, you didn't play D&D either. I remember that whole, it might have been the yeah. same San Diego trip when Victoria and I were talking about all the D&D campaigns and you were like, huh, what is this? Yeah, I eventually found a group of my own and uh, I've even run my own one shot with some friends, um, got really into it. Okay, this, we're basic, basically out of time, this, right? Yeah, this is what grad school will do to you. If you're lucky, there are many bad grad school outcomes. This is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> I mean, even the initial version of it, the, oh, I'm just going to throw this together in an afternoon version. I didn't hear what was said. Oh, he said it would have made one hell of a final project. Oh. <laughs> and indeed, indeed it would. Thank you so much. Yeah, happy to talk to everybody and see some faces. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>